Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spill the jams and spin the tea. I did it on purpose this time because we're in a topsy-turvy kind of mood today. We're doing an unusual video, a different kind of video. We're building up to our year-end lists, uh, but before we do that, we want to give a little bit of a shout-out to maybe some underheard records this year we wanted to sort of give a shout out to the little man and uh just sort of flesh everything out that we wanted to cover very properly on the show so tyler and i have decided we have accumulated 10 records each that we wanted to talk about that maybe we didn't get to talk about on the show we didn't get to properly cover but we thought deserved a shout out anyway at the end of the year don't count these records out when you make your own list tell us about records that you think you have gone a little bit underheard in the comments below before we finalize our list participate in the discussion by all means yeah absolutely this is kind of something that we decided jake and i decided to do last minute because we were originally going to record our worst albums start doing our proper music lists with all four of us but morgan and august are both kind of quite busy and unavailable at the moment so we decided to shelve that for next week and just do this in the meantime touch on some records that are overlooked as jake says that haven't maybe gotten the due that they fully deserve this year uh to varying degrees anyway some of them are maybe more underground than others but yeah it's just an excuse for us to get to really put these records in the spotlight before we start really digging into the meat of our most sort of significant albums of the year in both good and bad with the whole crew next weekend so how we're going to do this is uh, we each have 10 records that we've prepared as jake said and we're going to count them down sort of alternating so we'll start with jake's number 10 we'll start then we'll go on my number 10 and essentially we've ranked them su such that the they will get more and more, I guess, important to us and high in our estimation as the list goes on. So, Jake, why don't you kick us off? What is your number 10 most overlooked album of 2021? My number 10 is the album Imperial by the progressive metal band Soen. And you may or may not know about this band or this album just because of the lineup. Most notably, it was on my radar because it prominently features drummer Martin Lopez. And if you know who that is, uh, or if you don't know who that is, then you should. Because Martin Lopez was a member of podcast favorite band Opeth. He drummed on two of the most, like, basically two albums where I think the drumming was at its most essential, that being the duology of damnation and deliverance, uh, where the drumming is very standout. And he has his own progressive metal band, which is Soen. And Soen have had a really, really, really tight run of albums. They've, you know, they've had modest success. Lots of people in prog circles know about them. They're very, very, very often compared to Tool, which is not an unfair comparison at all. Frankly, I've heard a couple of their records, and that is pretty much what I would go for, too. A little bit more on early on, uh, their first record, Cognitive, is very reminiscent of stuff like early Tool records, mainly because of Lopez's drumming being very very, very similar in style to that of Danny Carey. Uh, and the latest entry in their discography, Imperial, while I wouldn't say it's their best album, I would certainly say it is one that is absolutely worthwhile. It is a fantastic meat and potatoes progressive metal album. It has really, really uh, clean uh, production and vocals. So, you know, it's accessible, it's easy to get into, but it also just kind of goes really, really hard. Thematically, it's got a lot to do with, uh, you know, current year, current time period. This is definitely uh, a metal album that is imbued with politics, but not super duper directly. You know, we're not talking about like Lamb of God or anything here. This is something that's mainly drenched in, in the drapery of metaphor. But basically every single song here is North four minutes, five minutes, six minutes long, really fleshed out prog tracks. And yeah, you come here for all of the technical work, which is all really solid. There's not like a real weak point on the album, but it really is the drumming that keeps this record afloat. It's punchy, it's invigorating. It's really exciting to listen to. If you are a prog nerd, this is a must listen for you this year. My number 10 is an album that we actually have reviewed, we did review this year formally on the show. I've got a couple of albums on this list that we did review. I've, As tried, do to, I. 
I've tried to avoid mostly albums we've already formally reviewed just because we have already mm -hmm. talked about them. But there are a couple I wanted to shout out as particularly overlooked this year. Uh, mm -hmm. And the first of those, the number 10 on my list is the most recent Manchester Orchestra album, The Million Masks of yes. God. This was, uh, if you watched our review or if you're familiar with this record, you'll remember this is a record that kind of came out as a sort of companion piece to the album that preceded it, which was, you know, in my and many people's estimation, the high watermark of this band's career, that being, of course, the brilliant um, a, a Black Mile to the Surface. And this record is a record that is comparatively darker, where that record sort of dealt with thing, with birth and new beginnings and uh, a sense of kind of wonder at the world. This is a much kind of darker and more sort of uh, morbid record to a certain extent. A lot of it is cloaked in grief, particularly grief surrounding the death of the father of one of the band members. And the songwriting as a result is more withdrawn even than the introspection that often colored Black Mile to the surface. And the songs themselves are maybe less immediate and less kind of gripping than what you might expect from Manchester Orchestra up to this point. And this was something I felt that we did touch on and maybe even overemphasize when we reviewed this album because it wasn't a, an album that went over terribly well with the whole group. It is an album that Morgan, as you may remember, is particularly passionate about and gave a very, very beautiful defense of. Um, I Every time I think about this record I immediately want to go back and listen to the things that he said about it because he really translated the poignancy of the songwriting here in a way that has helped me upon subsequent listens of this album to really start to connect with it more and more and I did like it a decent amount when we reviewed it but I think it's grown on me more and more as I've kind of lived with it and had it in my life as we kind of often emphasize on the show like we are limited in a certain sense because we wait a week to review stuff um, from after when it comes out but some records you do kind of just need to have exist in your life like it doesn't mean you need to be listening to them often but you need to kind of just have them exist for a while to really really get them and I feel like that happens a few times a year with things that we review and and this is maybe one of the strongest examples and of course I wanted to shout it out as well because it's an underrated record it did not create much fanfare for a band that are as sort of significant in the indie world as Manchester Orchestra and it's beautifully, as I said, it's beautifully conceptually unified. And it's also just a very easy listen in the sense that it's constructed like a continuous song cycle suite. So if you're a kind of a kind of person who loves when albums are constructed so that each song kind of just literally flows into the next song and you have a kind of a continuous experience without any kind of like cuts between songs, then you'll really enjoy this record because that's exactly what it is from front to back. And it's um, quite poignant and quite emotional. I've had found myself drifting more and more back to this more plaintive deep cuts on this album, songs like Way Back in the Internet that are beautifully uh, sad and, and powerful in the way that Andy Hull as a songwriter is really, really good at doing. And that, you know, I mean, Manchester Orchestra, they're, they've not, nor have they ever really been an emo band, but I feel like they get... Uh, a decent amount of emo comparisons because of mm -hmm. some of the tonalities of Andy Hull's voice, but also some of the ways that he writes and some of the ways that he translates furious emotion through a kind of Midwestern lens. And I think Manchester Orchestra's Million Masks of God is, is another really, really strong display of that, that I, if you've, even if you've never heard of this band before, I recommend checking it out. Um, and if you have heard it and you were underwhelmed like some of us were, I recommend coming back to it, letting it kind of stew for a little bit because it's yeah. a record that really can get under the skin if you let it. Yeah, I totally co-signed that. Tyler and I, like, we weren't as effusive uh, with our praise as Morgan was, but I, I co-signed basically everything Tyler said. Albums like this, sometimes it just takes a little bit of time. It's a really idiosyncratic record, and it definitely deserved a little bit better reception-wise, like not even necessarily from us, just generally speaking, deserves to be talked about a little bit more. And talking about an album that both Tyler and I have heard, uh, we're going to another one that both Tyler and I have heard with my number nine, uh, which is Sleigh Bell's album, Texas. Um, I'm definitely, I, I think we can both say basically the exact same thing we said, or you said for the Manchester Orchestra album of the sort of like initially being like, yeah, this is good. And then like, you know, upon another listen, I definitely dug it a little bit more. And then I listened to it three times and I was like, wow, this is an album that was worth listening to three times. And 
Basically, Tyler and I have both uh, talked a few times here and there about Sleigh Bell's album, previous album uh, before this, um, which is Jessica Rabbit, which frankly is a total candidate along with like, I don't know, um, the Block Party album four uh, up there for like the album that has gotten the worst reception in music or online circles that I just like unabashedly love and think is deserving of much better. Sleigh Bells uh, are a really weird idiosyncratic noise pop band that just they just kind of do whatever the fuck ever they want uh, when it comes to their sound. And uh, Jessica Rabbit is a, a perfect embodiment of that. And Texas, I think the initial thing that I had to get over with this album was the fact that it didn't really push their sound as far as Jessica Rabbit did. Uh, that said, I think that what this does is it distills the essence of this band very concisely. It's not as naughty or wiry as something like Jessica Rabbit is, but it's a sort of tightly packed, sort of more um, just focused album endeavor. You know, it's a 35 minute long record. It's it's a it's not exactly a commitment, but uh, it has the one of my favorite singles of the year in Locust Laced on it, which is just an absolute fucking banger. And, you know, that's really the core appeal of the album here is that it's really just front to back, banger after banger after banger. This is not a difficult album to get the appeal of. There's um, or there's the stuff like the album closer, Hummingbird Bomb. Um, I think that It Ain't Your Lost and Sweet 75 are basically just as good as songs like Locust Laced. Uh, and this, this album doesn't really ever lose me at any point. It's just consistently very, very, very fun. Nobody I heard really talked about it. And if there's anything that you are drawn to, it's like you have these really upbeat and bright Right, female vocal performances and some absolutely wicked guitar work to look forward to with this album. So please give this a spin. It's some good tooth rotting candy coated fun, but you're not going to regret your time with it, at least by my measure, you won't. Absolutely. And you know, the thing with Sleigh Bells is they made a huge splash. Um, I think it's been 10 years since their debut, maybe 11 mm -hmm. years since their debut, uh, Treats first hit. And that album is nuts that album is like one of the is the definitive noise pop record that album is zany that album is blown out that album is distorted as hell that album is frequently ear scraping and it's an <laughs> adrenaline rush and mm. the thing with sleigh bells is that album was quite successful for them and that album earned them a considerable amount of indie cred but almost as soon as that happened were the discussions of well sleigh bells are kind of a one-trick pony project they're kind of like and they didn't really do a lot to dissuade this with their second and third records which which did come off as kind of like pale paling in comparison to the kind of absolute hard-hitting nature of that debut and so by the the point at which sleigh bells had reached in the, in the middle of the decade where people had essentially kind of like forgotten about them entirely or just relegated them into this one album wonder band no one was really paying attention when Jessica Robert, Rabbit dropped and no one was really, you know, interested in accepting the possibility of Sleigh Bells being interesting and fascinating and fun in a new way that's different to how they had been. And the success of that record is that it brings together all of the, you know, cheeky, tooth-rotting, sugary, you know, influences of, of you know, hyper-pop that had been kind of circulating throughout the mm -hmm. decade as well, smashed into like, you know, Death Grips-esque sound collages yep. and really sharp songwriting. And yes. people just weren't receptive to that. And it's a real shame because I think that's one of the most underrated albums of the decade. And then Texas, not to, not to kind of veer too, way, too far away from this new album, but Texas is, mm. is, is a brilliant way of following that up because it takes some of the most... Uh, adrenaline rushy joys of an album like Jessica Rabbit and where that album's kind of unkemptness is a big attractive factor to me yeah um, it obviously isn't necessarily going to be for everyone so it tidies up the messier more ragged mm -hmm. elements of that new sound that they'd really debuted with that album and really just focuses and hones what Sleigh Bowers is best at doing at this particular juncture in time into its most um, just ear-catching and 
uh, infectious and really, really, really fun. Like you say, it's it's 35 minutes, it slaps nonstop. And you know, this is a year where we've had a lot of albums that do this kind of thing, where it's the distorted, like guitar stompy sound with the outrageous vocals. I mean, you can want to compare this to the Royal Blood record or the Death from Above 1979 records that came out this year. And those are records we, we, we absolutely tore a new asshole out of. Yep. And what's different about Sleigh Bells is that they understand how to make this really over-the-top stuff sound genuinely exciting, genuinely tongue-in-cheek. They know how to do something that's self-aware about what it is and something that is never less than entirely dedicated to the sheer focused goal of just having a fucking blast. It doesn't get caught up in anything other than that. And also, you know, a big part of it as well is front woman Alexis Krauss and her vocal yes. presence and her personality is something those other bands don't have. And her, and she has proper pipes and oh, she knows yeah. how to use them. And yeah, Sleigh Bells, I think, for as much love as their debut deservingly gets, I think that their output over the last five years has been particularly relegated in ways that really, really just bewilder me. And I think that they're as good as they ever have been. And I think if you're like the kind of, you know, queer person like us who really hmm. li likes things like 100 Gex and like the really kind of black dresses and the really kind of like outrageous. Poppy, that's crazy. a big, like this yeah. was basically what I wanted from the newest Poppy album. Yeah. And this, like, if you were disappointed by that, go right here because I promise you, you're going to get exactly what you want. Yeah. If that's your bag, listen to Texas by Slay Bells. It will hit all right mm -hmm. um, my number nine for the year is another album from a band that was big uh, a number of years ago and have kind of like fallen out of favor just because they've, they've kind of escaped their moment and they yeah. admittedly had a bit more of a tumultuous period of in recent times than sleigh bells but the band is liars and the album is their new comeback record the apple drop and the thing about Liars is I've talked about them a number of times on the podcast. Me and Zach are like huge Liars super fans. We got Jake into Liars earlier this year as well. And they are this chameleonic band, right? That started off as a dance punk band, became this kind of like tribal ambient noise rock band, and then eventually became this kind of like blaring synth pop rager band with the album that Jake is holding in his hands right now, Mess, uh, one of my favorite albums of the decade. And Mess. And... <laughs> and the chameleonic nature of Liars is something that keeps them appealing from album to album right up to Mess, their kind of 2014 like spectacular. But the band fell apart after Mess and key band member Aaron Hemphill left the band and left frontman Angus Andrew kind of adrift. And over the years that followed, he put out a number of records under the Liars name that were interesting, had kind of like ideas that needed to be kind of fully fleshed out that kind of felt adrift and those albums were really consumed by the narrative that you know Angus was now alone and had to kind of like steer the ship where his creative partners had deserted him and so with the apple drop Angus makes a really smart decision of forming a new band entirely he keeps the liar's name but he recruits new musicians he create he recruits musicians who have varied talents on various instruments and what you get as a result is a record that has more instrumental diversity and variation than any liar's record that precedes it has more color and polish and genuinely kind of exciting production than any record bar mess of course and you get an album that while it doesn't quite have the off the wall kind of like, what the fuck am I listening to? Just bizarro qualities of some of Liar's most enduring records. It's a bit more, and I say this in an endearing way, it's a bit more wallpapery, um, but it does have a lot of really nice texture. It has a lot of really great grooves on it as well. It's a record where having recruited these new band members, the one thing you notice most strongly about this new iteration of Liars is how strong the rhythm section is. And I'm not talking about like a fucking, you know, hammering the drum kit and bass notes all up the fucking wazoo progressive type shit. I'm just talking about a rhythm section that are really, really locked in to making this kind of gloomy but colorful and 
texturally diverse post-punky sort of stuff. It, 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 if I were to compare it to any of Lyra's previous material, I would say it's kind of like a meshing or meeting point of their album Wish You and their album Sister World, which if you're a Lyra's fan, you'll know those two albums are completely unalike. One is a minimal techno record and the other one is a fucking like noise rock album. And yet it takes certain elements of the kind of harshness and zany kind of off the wall craziness of sister world and tempers them with the more moody tones of wish you and the result is a record that is as unique and special and flavorful as any album liars have made it doesn't immediately rank up with the absolute best material they've put out but it exceeded my expectations considering how kind of forgettable the post mess material had been up to this point and it makes me really excited to see the future of this project and whether this new and quite creatively energized group of musicians can really like do something even more ambitious with their next project. So I would say that regardless of whether you've heard a Lyra's record or not, the Apple Drop, if you like sort of minimal sort of groove based post punky electronic influenced music, if that's your vibe, give the Apple Drop a shot, had some great great singles on this record. I particularly want to shout out the song Big Appetite, which is actually one of my favorite Lyra songs, full stop. So yeah, this thing is definitely not short of highlights, uh, went under the radar, and deserves to be heard, in my opinion. All right. Uh, if we're going to move along to my number eight, um, I have elected to use this spot on the list to do a bit of, um, uh, of, shall we say, friend promotion, because there, I have two albums that are literally right next to each other uh, on my list, and they are made by two people who really, really, really deserve a shout out. We have technically covered both of these, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them now, but they are, of course, Fell From The Trees album Enough, and of course, Sersha and the Agenda's Panic Attacks in Public. Both of these albums are, you know, self-made by these two people who obviously, uh, Hannah is a friend of the podcast. Uh, we were very, very honored to be able to get a, a bit of a, a press release uh, album of that made us feel very, very special. And um, Enough is just genuinely a, a fantastic project. And that this is not the last you will be hearing of this podcast speaking on this particular album, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But Enough is a fantastically fleshed out bedroom pop album that just front to back, again, it's kind of like some of the stuff I've talked about already is that it's a album that has no discernible weak point for me. And it has one of the easy highlights of the year in songs like I Tread Water and Dress, frankly. They've had hooks in them that have stayed in my head all year. And this was an album that came out at the very, very, very start of this year. So not only did it have the whole indie thing going against it, but it had the fact that it's, you know, most likely to get memory hold because if it comes out super duper early, it's you know, gets threatened to get washed away. So if you haven't heard this, please take the time to do so. Again, it's a very, very personal, very intimate project where the lyricism is totally something you need to pay attention to because the songwriting is generally quite outstanding. But that also doesn't mean you should ignore the production on this particular record either because it's incredibly dense. It's incredibly creative, incredibly diverse and lush. It's something that I didn't really even envision being something that like a bedroom pop album would be. I mean, could have fooled me, frankly. And I just just wanted to congratulate Hannah on doing such a great job of it and we really really look forward to the potential future projects of yours and we will happily cover them uh, and also of course Sersha former member of this podcast Panic Attacks in Public is just again a great meat and potatoes punk album project you know folk punk memes and you know how can you say no to an album that has songs like ben shapiro blues or david fincher was born innocent i mean like like sincerely tell me to my face that you just you, you can't find something to love with that alone but again if you want something that is in you know has the appeal of like an early against me record or even you know early um green day records uh, uh the uh, 99 revolutions cover 
or notwithstanding, which is a great cover, by the way, it has some of the best songs of the year on here. Notably speaking, Black, Black Magic, Magic yeah. and yes, Black Magic and Song for a Friend, which are two songs that I have spun multiple times this year. Both of these projects are very much worth your time. I'm not just here pimping out people just because I like them. It's because they happen to make good music too. Mm. And I co-sign everything you said. I mean, the obvious thread with these two releases that we kind of have not said out loud is that these are two yeah. bedroom releases from trans women that are speak, you know, quite explicitly on the experience of, you know, coming to terms with your gender identity and coming out and the experience of being out as trans or in the case of Sir Hannah's experience, the, um, the, the journey towards kind of like coming out. And so those are themes that are deeply embedded in both of these records and are expressed and are expressed quite poetically and beautifully in the best songs on both of these yes. albums. Uh, with regard to Hannah's record, I think I can't emphasize enough the how good it sounds as well. Like it, in many ways, the obvious comparison mm -hmm. that I'm sure Hannah's gotten sick of hearing is the Postal Service, but it has that kind of like synth poppy kind of. I like, made that myself when we yes. reviewed it. Yeah, uh, sound to it, and it's gorgeous and. Her skills as a sort of producer and mixer cannot be understated as well. You can really hear the fact that she yes. has done production and mixing work for other artists as well. That's something that she has refined. Mm -hmm. And it really shows through and just how good the record sounds. And again, how poignant its best moments are. Wink, wink, we may be talking about them again, as Jack alluded. And with regards to Sersha's record as well, I mean, it's really tough for us when it comes to wanting to talk about and shout out albums from that or art or that members of this podcast have made because invariably we're going to feel like it's coming across like of course we're going to celebrate this because it's you know we have a personal investment in the person who made it but I really can't emphasize how these projects this project stands so strongly on its own apart from our relationship with Sersha and how much we know her and how much we know what has gone into this record the songs are there uh, especially on highlights like This Shit's Brand New, So Long, mm. Black Magic, as has already been mentioned. Um, a beautiful mix of more tender moments like Bad Seeds and, again, some of that folk punk sound that has so clearly influenced Saoirse if you've heard her speak about music for more than two minutes ever at any time. <laughs> so, yeah, check out these records. Um, they're both available on Bandcamp. I'll make a point to put links in the description as well. Yes. And if you want to hear us talk more about them, our formal reviews are there as well. My number eight album is a record that I just caught up with very recently that came out much, much earlier this year that I've been meaning to hear. Uh, it was actually initially put onto this record by August of all people, which is really surprising when you consider the kind of record that this is. Um, but the album is uh, the, the debut record from the band Dry Cleaning titled New Long Leg. Now, as we've kind of emphasized earlier in the year when we reviewed records from bands like Black Country, New Road and Squid, like we're very much living in an era now where this new style of post-punk, this new style of English post-punk based around kind of South England and London and those kinds of places are, you know, they're, they're reaching a kind of like fever pitch within their cultural cachet and you're getting these bands that are kind of rising to prominence and you know releasing some of the most significant music in this realm like you're really much embedded in this way and as a result of that I think it's quite easy for bands that are working in this niche to maybe get overlooked or maybe suffer from comparisons to the the totemic masterpieces of of bands like Black Country New Road and Black Midi in my opinion and I think that dry cleaning, though they have definitely gotten some cred and they've definitely gotten some really, really strong reviews this year, I've not really seen enough people talking about this record as evidenced by the fact that I only just caught up to it recently. And listening to it, while it's not something I'm head over heels in love with quite yet, it definitely has the potential to get there for me. There's a lot about it that's so idiosyncratic and so unique and so special that you just can't get this effect and this experience anywhere else. Instrumentally, you have a, a reasonably above average post-punk band that are working through some quite strange and off-kilter arrangements at times, but some of which remind me of The Drones, another sort of post-punk influenced band that I really, really, really love. But the star of the show is vocalist Florence Shaw, who is 
Yeah. The, the best comparison is that she's kind of like a cross between Patti Smith and Laurie Anderson. She is this kind of like poetess figure who essentially delivers all of her vocals in spoken word, but she does it in this way where she speaks with this kind of like uh, enigmatic and attractive hushed whisper quality where she's not even really trying to project her voice at all and that can be something that puts people off this band I get it as the vocalist isn't exactly like oozing like loudness or like a desire to kind of like overwhelm the spectrum like in some respects like in terms of the style of how she writes and the surrealist approach to lyricism and and the emotion that often under, under, underpins it it's kind of not dissimilar to another classic um, British band Life Without Buildings and their front woman but where that is a band where the vocals are outrageous and in your face and just ballistic with dry cleaning Florence Shaw's vocals are more in line with what you would expect from this current wave of post-punk but so distinct and the pure nonsense surrealism of the way that they're constructed and the way that the effect that they have on you and it's a really strange and unique experience this album might not be something you fall head over heels for but I guarantee you it's a re it's an experience that will be unlike anything else and if you're attuned to this particular kind of idiosyncratic style of music there's every possibility this could end up being one of your favorite albums of the whole year because it's so unabashedly its own thing within that realm and it has moments of utter brilliance that are sprinkled across it as well songs like scratch card lanyard the opening track song like her hippo the title track and um the brilliant more big birds uh brilliant brilliant um strange esoteric music that I found really, really exciting and challenging, and I'm looking forward to listening to it again and again. And yeah, August shadowed it out early this year. I know he wasn't crazy about it, but I'm glad he put it on the radar because it's a band that if you have any kind of interest in anything remotely related to the niche this band fits into or that fits along with any of what I've just said, you'll, you'll dig this quite a bit. So yeah, it's a shout from me. Moving to my number seven, we have a project that I have mentioned briefly in a what we've been listening to segment, but I'm pretty sure this was pretty early on or in the middle of the year when we were kind of getting swamped with releases and it probably went under the radar of many people just because of the kind of album it is. But the album in question is by the metal band Amen Ra. A-M-E-N-R-A. -E Their newest record, which is called De Dorn, which De Dorn, that's a terrible name. Um, however, it's a great album, like properly uh, great, in my opinion. It's five very distinct uh, pieces. It's of, you know, it's almost 50 minutes long, and it has honestly such a unique combination of things as Tyler just mentioned something that has spoken word on it this also has a hefty dose of spoken word as well it has things in it that are you know really like the first track of it the first part of it dabbles in like dark ambient music and then it becomes doom metal this really apocalyptic atmospheric sludgy thing that's just I've heard things that are kind of like it before, but nothing has really had the weight and heft that something like this has had. They, this band is particularly like pretty acclaimed when it comes to their series of records. They've done what they've been doing uh, since the mid 2000s and they have done it once again here. Um, I really need to just sort of plow through the rest of their discography just because this is a project that's worthy of getting into a band for. and. Uh, let me tell you, when I say this is one of the heaviest metal albums of 2021, I mean it. This is definitely on the slower side, sure, but again, doom metal fans, this one is for you. This is not just pummeling, this is not just impactful, this is downright universe-shattering shit. The first track legitimately blew me away and frightened me at one point, uh, and it, it's just an intoxicatingly nocturnal experience. The lead singer can go for from that really quiet, really intimate spoken word thing that really sets the tone well. And then he will just be screaming and it is chilling. 
it's definitely one of the metal albums this year that has had the firmest grasp on its tone and i really really appreciate that it is something that it's not particularly complicated but it is instrumentally dense and it is more than worth your time if any of this sounds interesting to you go 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 check it out um it's a really unique combination of lots of different things that's you know any even in isolation don't get a lot of attention so i, I feel like this one really kind of swooped in under the radar uh so to speak but like if you're interested in any one of these things totally check this out this may be uh, an all-timer band for some people that people might be sleeping on just because they're you know european and it just sort of you know goes completely over your head if you're not super duper famous so please go check out didorn by amun ra my number seven is the second of the two albums on my list that we have already formally reviewed which is mogwise as the love continues and like with the other album that we already reviewed on my list, the Manchester Orchestra Record, this is another album that I gave a broadly positive, if a bit mixed, review when we reviewed it that has grown on me exponentially throughout the year. And I would say even more so than the Manchester Orchestra album, this album's grown on me quite strongly to the point where I would call it one of the year's best rock records of any description. Uh, and what's so fascinating about that is that Mogwai are a band, you know, post-rock legends, Mogwai, they were one of the, have been one of the definitive bands of the kind of post-rock boom of the late 90s, alongside bands like God's You Black Emperor. They came onto the scene at that time doing some of the most primal, doing some of the most intense, doing some of the most loud instrumental rock music that, I mean, some of their early shit is still terrifying to this day. And the progression of Mogwai's career, and they've been a band that I've been listening to since I was like 14, the progression of their career has been really, really fascinating because they've never lost touch with that sense of dynamics in their music, that sense of the quiet, loud relationship, that sense of um, knowing how to absolutely blow your fucking ears out at any given moment, sometimes without warning. But what Mogwai have developed, while that has remained a constant, what they have developed is the color and shades of their sound, the diversity of the things that they use to express it. Mogwai, I think, are a band that often get painted as this two-dimensional group, like Sleigh Bells to a certain extent, who have this like mold, this niche that they fit into, this kind of like really straightforward template that they copy from album to album to album. And I think that is a hole that a lot of post-rock bands end up getting slumped into bands like Explosions in the Sky, for instance, where they make these great records, but then each of their records kind of starts to seem like they're sort of just recycling the previous ones. And that can lead to gem albums that might come later in the career getting overlooked. And I think that's the case for Mogwai, even though I think they deserve a bit more credit than that because they have like tried to switch up what they do. Uh, a little bit on every single record. I mean, they are, have some really strong late career albums like Hardcore Will Never Die, But You Will, and the very underrated 2018 album, Every Country's Son. But the thing with Mogwai is they've kind of, even before those underrated records, or even before those records that they made in the 2010s where they started to really kind of diversify their sound and started to do soundtrack work for projects like Le Revenant and Atomic, even before then, people had just sort of said, well, they're just, you know, kind of mood, ambient, whatever. They're just instrumental black music that belongs to the late 90s, early 2000s. And when you want a hit of that era and of that time, you put on those records. Mogwai, regardless, have continued trying to refine and trying to complicate the template of what they do. And it's taken me a few months this year, it's taken me a, a lot of listening and a lot of just having this record kind of on to really, really appreciate this, but Mogwai are better than ever at doing what they're doing. No, this isn't a classic album on the level of their records like Young Team and Come On Die Young and Rock Action, but it's fucking up there. It's really, really strong stuff, and it is some of the most dynamic and some of the most ambitious and original and creative music they've done within their scope. I mean, I'm not talking about it being like a fucking, you know, Scott Walker type thing. Like, yeah, this is definitely post-rock within, as you would expect from Mogwai. You listen to it, you wouldn't mistake it for any other band. But there are lots of beautiful surprises on this record that 
I wasn't really expecting. There are collaborations with Atticus Ross, for instance, who conducts a, a gorgeous string section on the song Midnight Flit. You have a stunning appearance from saxophonist Colin Stetson on the track Pat Stains. You have a industrial hip hop esque vocal effects banger ballad on this record you have some of the most tender music of the year that's soaked in effects to make it sound warped and demonic you have those heaving hefty seven eight minute long post-rock bangers you have the best smashing pumpkin song in 20 years with the track <laughs> ceiling granny on this album like seriously listen to this and tell me that it doesn't sound exactly like something off of siamese dream and somehow just as good while being completely instrumental like this album for me anyway while it's not reinventing the wheel in any way it was full of surprises and has been really really rewarding to come back to throughout the year and i think that's the quality of it is, is seen in the fact that it was nominated for the Mercury Prize, I believe the first Mogwai album to be nominated for that uh, award, and deservingly so. I think that if you enjoy Shades of Post Rock, but if you like seeing distortion and effects and electronics and weird sort of instrumental palettes sort of malleably kind of uh, infused into that genre, then you'll really dig the new Mogwai record. As the love continues, check it out. My number six is something uh, that, like the previous album, I did briefly mention for just a second on uh, what we've been listening to, but it was earlier on in the year, like April, May-ish, and this is an album that just generally speaking has gotten like no attention, at least not as much as I think. And while this particular album is not exactly the most fleshed out project, um, it, it's really more a uh, an opportunity to get in on the ground floor, that being the self-titled Beachy Head album. And this album is notable because it's sort of being sold and marketed on the fact that it is uh, a band that comprised of a couple of people, most notably someone from Slow Dive and someone who was a member of the Flaming Lips. And as you might expect, this is the exact kind of music that the that kind of fusion would yield. It's kind of a shoegaze dream pop neo psych album and you know it's not exactly surprising to hear that i am a big fan of that personally i think the album that is you know it's really concise it's about 30 minutes long it's eight tracks and there's not exactly a particular like huge weak point on it but it's the highlights here that are just astonishing i actually think that michael is a song that is so good it's just it is a damn shame that it is not going to make it onto my best songs of the year list but if we could expand it a bit it totally fucking would it is a perfect shoegaze song uh just like absolutely like you could hate the rest of this album and i would say that it's worth it but songs that are uh, also like it distraction is another absolutely fantastic the guitar tones on this album are just so warm so beautiful it's it's a perfect summer record i actually got in on the ground floor and pre-ordered the vinyl on this band's band camp off the strength of singles alone and i was not disappointed at all um i really 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 want this project to go somewhere um just to get a little bit more attention so they can kind of expand the unique edge that they have to both of these genres by combining them uh it really does yield something special and you know even if it's not your bag at the end of the day it's not that long of a record so you know if you devote yourself to it i don't really think that even if you don't like it it's not exactly going to to you know create a, a hole in your day where you wish that you uh, spent time otherwise it's just a really really solid record and um you know if you're a shoegaze head like me this is a totally essential listen uh it's got like 200 ratings on rate your music which just Please, for the love of God, if, I'm a, if a member of Slow Dive is in your album, then you, you, you need more attention than that, frankly. But yeah, go check that out. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, another side project featuring Rachel Goswell of Slow Dive, that being Minor Victories, which is a super group that oh, yeah. also features members of Editors and uh, Mogwai. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yes. then they put out a brilliant album in 2016 that like 10 people have heard, including me. So <laughs> It's on my list, so I'm, I'm going to get to it. My number six 
is again a record that is overlooked in a certain sense but if you I guess travel in critical circles then maybe you would dispute this being an overlooked album although again I still think very few people have, have talked about it this year it got a bit of buzz when it came out and more of that was just because people found it fascinating that it kind of even existed in the first place uh, and this is the collaborative record between Matt Sweeney and Bonnie Prince Billy, Super Wolves. Now, a bit of context here. This is actually the second record that these two have made together. And the first record, Super Wolf, actually came out 16 years ago. So it's a sequel that has been long in the pipeline. And it's a project that showcases the strengths of these two musicians um, and at, at their absolute peak. I mean, Bonnie Prince Billy, if you know anything about folk, folk music, you know that he is a pretty significant figure in the world of indie folk from the you know, early uh, 2000s, late 90s. Real name, of course, being Will Oldham. You may, have know, you may know him from film appearances that he's made as well. A really, really significant indie folk musician. Matt Sweeney, however, uh, is a slightly less well-known figure, but in my opinion, the even more interesting of the two, because he is a guitarist, kind of like a session guitarist, but he's also been in a number of significant bands, including Guided by Voices, Chavez, and the incredibly underrated Billy Corgan side project, Zwan. And um, Matt Sweeney is one of the most underrated guitarists of his time, I think. His, uh, his unique flavor, his unique tone, his unique style of playing, is not exactly gonna you know blow your mind but it makes for simple folk songs that really stick in your brain and really kind of linger and are quite musically satisfying in ways that I think a lot of folk music doesn't necessarily try to be and sometimes can be overlooked for it's just how musically satisfying a really good folk sort of guitarist slash rock guitarist in an indie context can be and Sweeney's work on this record I think is outstanding but of course it wouldn't be a great record if it were just Sweeney alone what makes us really elevates it is the songwriting of Bonnie Prince Billy, who is showcasing that while still working within his folk template of songwriting, he's still writing some of his most affecting, some of his most emotional, and some of his most beautiful songs to date. Uh, there are some really genuinely moving songs here about growing old, about your relationship with your children, about your relationship with the person that you used to be, about your relationship with your body. Uh, there is a beautiful song on this record called My Blue Suit, which, whether intentionally or not, spoke very strongly to me. Because when this album came out, I happened to be going through a period of pretty fucking awful body um, dysphoria, gender dysphoria that had was really messing with me and this song really spoke to me in this quite tender way with lyrics like I'll whisper in your ear and no one ever has to know I support you here I will love you as you go you look better in my blue suit than I do and fuck that shit just really got me eh? and it's not and it's not me just kind of picking a song out and saying this is amazing the tender songwriting like that that's really that really has the ability to cut through to you is all over this record there's a song on this album called resist the urge which i think is like a fucking classic folk rock song like an all-time classic folk rock song that has been made in the year 2021 like it's up there with the best music of america classic americana artists like john prine which actually it reminds me of quite strongly uh it's a beautiful song about reassuring your loved ones that your impending death is not the end of the world and that you will be with them when you're gone and it's it's fucking incredible like again this is not necessarily an album that's going to make you go like damn this musicality is like all-timer shit but Sweeney's playing is tasteful enough and creative enough and Bonnie Prince Billy's writing is sharp and emotional enough that the combo really creates something special and yeah this album got a little bit of buzz when it came out and yeah critics fawned over it because you know these are two figures who are like you know critic um catnip right they're gonna get adulation no matter what but this truly feels like one of the most vital things that either artist has been involved in in a long time so check this shit out it's a really really strong album 
moving right along into the top five, uh, I have an album from the very interesting and sort of new and up and coming, uh, very idiosyncratic metal act, Loathe. Uh, primarily, they're sort of in an upswing of popularity because of their 2020 album, I Let It In and It Took Everything, uh, which is a pretty popular record, got some decent acclaim. Uh, and I am here to talk about their follow up to that record, the 2021 release, The Things They Believe. And this got a comparatively muted reception um, uh, from people because, well, I mean, the original uh, album that sort of got them all of the attention that they deservingly got, in my opinion, is that their sort of metal sound is very, I would describe it as very similar to Deftones in that they're just, you can only really just call them alternative metal just because they combine so many different things to make a, a singular quintessential sound. They mix up things like shoegaze and metalcore and, and all kinds of shit that we, we really, really love. Uh, I'm sure that if we got the chance to review that album on on the podcast it would have done particularly well and in their follow-up to that record they elected to pivot a, a complete 180 turn and make an ambient drone album with the things they believe and to put it plainly the things they believe is just one of the most beautiful ambient albums i've heard in some time frankly uh it's also got kind of a progressive electronic feel it's a little bit more active it's not quite as plaintive as you might expect an ambient drone album to be um the segues between some of the songs here might come across as a little bit insubstantial but the main pieces here are absolutely astonishing they're bright they're beautiful they're dense uh, a lot of the stuff that i think that is channeled into this record like with songs like the year everything and nothing happened is that this is definitely an album that feels like it's the collective channeled negativity of uh the band from that particular year and they sort of put it into this and it feels like a cleansing it feels like a wash there's definitely a a sonic progression to this it starts out in a really eerie really plaintive place and ends off in this this really really this bright heavenly place and it's just been absolutely essential uh, ambient music for me, especially the very start of the year. It was something that I just couldn't stop using to as fuel for like writing and whatnot. And honestly, it's it's just a, a fantastic experiment from a really quintessential up and coming metal band that totally deserves a little bit more love. I love that they have been able to sort of flex their versatility like this. I mean, the things, um, not the things they believe, but um, I let it in and uh, took everything was proof concept enough that these guys could do just about anything they set their minds to. And then they do this. I mean, my God, I, I cannot wait for whatever project they make that comes next. But the two that we have right now, as well as their first album, are already signs that Loathe is a band to pay attention to. This is a, a record that I have properly spun and stayed in the top echelon of my favorite albums of the year until like the last second so definitely give this a listen if it sounds appealing to you um metal band pivoting into ambient music the obvious point of reference here that immediately comes to mind is the norwegian black metal band ulver and yes the way they p- pivoted to sort of trap hop slash sort of progressive ambient mm -hmm. with Perdition City. I haven't heard this new Loathe record, but I'm very curious to see. I'm very curious. I want to go back and listen to their album from 2019 that made waves. Then I want to listen to this and see yes. if the transition is the same sort of thing because that particular genre pivot is fascinating to me. And I oh, wonder- yeah. I know um, Sersha was also a really big fan of this album. So I wanted to shout that out on her account as well. That's how I came across it in the first place. All right. Well, my number five is a very special record. Like the dry cleaning record, this is an album I just, I've discovered very, very recently, like in the last week. Although mm -hmm. slightly more forgivably, it's also an album that has only been out for about actually a month. Exactly. Mm. So it is an album called Frailty by a band called Delete Zeke. And this band name is spelled D-L-T-Z-K. So there's no vowels in it. 
um, but it's pronounced delete Zeke. I learned about this yeah. through IndieCast and immediately once this album was described to me, I immediately knew this would be something that would pique my interest because this is an Indietronica glitch pop, hyper pop emo album. And it is a really fascinating collision of styles. And it is, again, with some of these albums, I've been like, this is really overlooked and you should check it out. Even if I'm not like, you know, one of my absolute favorites of the year, you should really check it out because it has a lot going for it and deserves more love. I've been like that with a few albums so far. This is where we get to the point where I unabashedly fucking adore this album and the rest of the albums on my list. And they deserve the fucking world. And this album is no exception. This record is one of the most, one of the biggest discoveries from the unknown for me of this entire year. It is an absolutely stunning emo record that sounds completely unique within the world of emo, within the new kind of fifth wave of emo that we are currently existing in. And this year, I think 2021 has been a year for this fifth wave of emo to really kind of coalesce into its own identity across careful, the world. careful, Tyler, you're going to get the Redditors mad at you. No, I mean, there's no one, I don't know, if there's anyone who's not celebrating this new fifth wave of emo, I don't want to know them. Um, no, they don't, they don't like calling it that. They were very uh, vocal about that when we put our uh, most recent Black Gaze uh, project episode review on there. They were very uppity about it. Well, fuck them, because it's fifth wave. <laughs> and I, I have done my research on this. Okay? I'm not just bandying about terms. This is not even the last fifth wave record I'm going to talk about in this video. Literally but, what it is. But regardless of, of genre labels, this record rules. It's brilliant. Again, I, just think about that for a bit. Like an emo record that's channeled through an electronic slash hyper pop lens. It has like the vibes of, of, of an artist. Like I'm trying to think of comparison points that will be meaningful here. Like it's kind of like Black Dresses, I guess, but less insane and more sort of like focused into songwriting. And it's just this glitchy sort of like distorted uh dreamscape of sounds there and what really holds to, holds it together is how brilliant the songwriting is some of the best songs of the year on this album including kodak moment misplace uh movies for guys the brilliant closing track let's go home the amazing album standout among standouts how to lie this record is stacked from front to back. It is an hour long, but it flies by. It has such a unique uh, timbre and such a unique combination of um, uh, influences and effects and sounds. And I've only had a chance to listen to this twice so far, but I can tell this is an album that's going to really, really uh, impinge itself higher and higher on my ranking of albums of the year the more time I spend with it I mean that's the only real downside to albums that come out in like November December is that when you're trying to like finalize the year you're conscious of the fact that this stuff is still you know the stuff that came out in January February is maybe a bit more advantaged than this stuff but um, it deserves to be heard I think check this shit out it might even if you're not entirely won over by the genre description, it might be the fusion of those things that wins you over because it does those things in a really accessible and quite powerful and potent way, I think. And so, yeah, it gets my highest recommendation. Delete Zeke's Frailty. Amazing, amazing album. All right, closing in. Uh, number four on my list is an album that I have effusively praised in what we've been listening to segments. And once again, I will say to I will say it here. This is one of the albums that like I had in mind when we were you know coming up with an idea to do sort of an overlooked albums video. Is this is the quintessential overlooked album? Uh, when I talked about it, it didn't even have a rate your music page. In fact, and that is Mask of the Phantasms' new axial age. Uh, Mask of the Phantasm are in Austin, Texas uh, band. Um, and they have no other projects other than this debut record right now. And if you listen to anything I say, just like before in the what we've been listening to second when I brought this up, if you listen to any of what I have to say, take any of my recommendations seriously, let it be this one. Because if I had to come up with like a ratio, like a mathematic equation here to be like, what is the most underrated album of the year mathematically? If you do like a proportion of how good something is versus how many people actually listened to it or reviewed it or talked about it or whatever, 
unequivocally, this would be number one. Uh, this album is basically engineered to appeal to people who, you know, consider themselves in line with the tastes of our podcast. Uh, I came across it initially because it was mentioned in the Mars Volta subreddit. And that is very, very, uh, it's a very good comparison because if you like the Mars Volta, specifically albums like Octahedron, albums like Nocturnicate, then I have good news for you because New Axial Age is an album that takes elements of like art rock and progressive rock and makes this very, very, very aggressive sort of like, it, it sort of cakes it all in like an alt rock coat of paint, which makes it really easy to get into, but also really, really transfixing that makes you listen to it. Maybe you don't get along with everything about it, but then if you give it another listen, you're like, wow, this is actually really, really instrumentally compelling. I would also describe it as uh, the main uh, female vocalist. She reminds me a lot of Amy Lee of Evanescence. Uh, very, very powerful, very melodramatic. That's not a, a, a disparaging term, by the way. I mean, it's like a very emotive uh, voice. It's perfect for something like this. I mean, the vocals enough or worthwhile hearing the record for, but the instrumental diversity on this record for an album that just basically has no precedence. It's just absolutely astounding. There are multiple saxophone breakdowns at the end of songs on this record. Uh, the opener, Red, Blue, Black, White, is just an all-around fantastic progressive rock song, but it's the follow-up track, Exit Wounds, that's the album standout here, which is just a blast. This is an out, this is a uh, studio produced album. This sounds incredible. And Exit Wounds, uh, a lot of the stuff here is just like, you can tell it was tinkered over and slaved over. Uh, the thematic content of this album is fascinating. It's very current, very modern, and kind of like online in certain spots, but it appeals to the sort of loneliness, the sort of disillusion, the sort of um, the, the many ways that you can feel separated from the sort of modernity these days, especially with, you know, COVID and, you know, isolation and the internet, it, it just very plays into that. It's very like Satoshi Kone in uh, the way it writes. Um, and then it just has songs that are like Last Call for Anxiety and Dreams Dying on a Dance Floor, which just unequivocally slap. This is an album that is not difficult to see the appeal of in any way, shape, or form. It has a little bit weirder of a sound that you might expect, but I'm telling you, once you really give yourself over to this album, this could be an album of the year candidate for you. And I want people to listen to this band because I want them to make more music because the world is better off with musicians doing weird, wacky shit like this that's imbued with so much personality. I want bands like them to take over the fucking world. And the 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 landscape of music right now is primed for something like that. So fucking stop what you're doing right now. It's a 45 minute long album, something like that. And just spin this. And if you like any of it, tell your friends about it, tell their friends. This deserves more than fucking 30 ratings on Rate Your Music. It it's fucking great. I've returned to it multiple times this year, and each time I was blown away by a different aspect of it, and I was heartbroken that it couldn't land on my list proper this year. I've just been doing a little bit of research on this while you've been speaking, because they now have oh. a radio music page, which they didn't before yes. when you first talked about it. And mm -hmm. I mean, the Mars, no wonder they showed up on a Mars Volta subreddit, because two of the members of this band used to be in the Mars Volta. Um, no shit! Yes. Oh. So, and those two members are uh, woodwind slash saxophonist slash horn player Adrian Terrazas Gonzalez, who played oh, yes, who played woodwinds on Francis the Mute, on Bedlam and Goliath, and on Amputecture, and it has the drummer of this band is a person named Thomas Pridgen, who played the drums on Bedlam and Goliath and Octahedron. So. Yeah, I mean, no wonder you're hearing these things because, yeah, this is essentially an offshoot of admittedly minor members of the Mars Volta who only played on a couple of their albums, but still, like, no oh. wonder you're hearing so much of that passion and fire in the saxophone playing or in the mm -hmm. instrumentation and percussion because, yeah, you, you literally have that lineage in the DNA of this band. So, again, we emphasize, I still haven't heard this, I'm going to listen to it before the year is out, but if you like the Mars Volta, you need to get on this shit. I mean, they're a Texas band as well. So, I mean, yes, absolutely. 
so my number four on this list, again, I think you're slightly better than me at really, really shouting out proper under the radar shit because my number mm. four on this rec- on my list is a record that has gotten a decent amount of love as well but still feels a little bit underrated comparatively a lot of the year-end lists from a lot of critical publications have been coming out and i was expecting to see this on more than i have and so that was a little bit surprising to me um, but the record is madhu mokhtar's a freak victim yeah now this album madhu mokhtar is a nigerian guitarist and instrumentalist and absolute fucking mastermind and a freak vic team is a fantastic fantastic fusion of western african music and western progressive psychedelic rock music um stuff so it's a great sort of marriage of african musical sounds particularly localized to niger where mokhtar is from and things that Western audiences will be more primed to appreciate and recognize from the lineage of psych rock and blues rock and, you know, rock music in general. And the obvious sort of comparison with regard to Mokhtar's guitar playing, which is virtuosic is an understatement, by the way, is Hendrix. He plays so much like Hendrix, it's not fucking funny how... And it's not to say that he is aping the sound of Hendrix's playing. It's just to say that he has a particular fire in him that is so reminiscent of Hendrix and like the real, you know, the biggest fusion guitarist of the 70s, like John McLaughlin, for instance, as well, from Mahavishnu Orchestra. Like if you like Hendrix and if you like Mahavishnu Orchestra, you need to get the fuck on this album. This shit rips uh, in some respects, it reminds me of like a kind of Africanized version of what bands like um, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard try to do. And where their records kind of leave me a bit cold sometimes because they can sometimes feel sort of like two dimensional, like one note with their sound. A Freak Vic Team is a beautifully diverse record that incorporates so many different musical elements and lineages and styles and does it into this beautiful 41 minute tight suite of sound and climaxing with some of the most blistering guitar work on the title track and the finale of this album that you will hear all year long. It's no wonder that this has started to make some waves because of how sort of welcoming it is for this sort of style of music to Western audiences, but it's a beautiful, beautiful way of immersing yourself in an African culture and experiencing the music that in a way that's so gripping and just absolutely doesn't waste a second of its runtime. It's a beautiful, beautiful album. And I'm pleased to see it getting making some waves, but it deserves to be making a lot more waves than it is. The Do Mock Tars of Freak Fit team, listen to this album. Fuck yeah, this is definitely one that I'm definitely going to hear just before the end of the year because I know that I need to. So fuck yeah, absolutely. Uh, now we're in the top three. And somewhat anticlimactic to come out with an album that's basically just gets by purely on the merit of its fundamentals. But that being said, this is another album like New Axial Age, where it seemingly has no real, well, I mean, at least upon first glance, has no real precedent here. This is the self-titled album Knife by the German band Knife. And this podcast, if you know, you pay attention to us uh, and generally speaking, know the kinds of stuff we like, you will know that we are big, big classic metalheads. Uh, properly, Morgan and I are just really, really into all eras of metal. And there's nowhere I feel more at home than in the world of heavy metal and speed metal and um things like that. And Knife have come along to just say, hey, you know what? We're going to be exactly like uh, uh, Defenders of the Faith era Judas Priest, where we balance uh, heavy metal and speed metal. But also, we're going to kind of combine a sort of black metal, death metal tinge with our our vocals and just how hard our riffs are and how rough some of the production is sometimes, uh, and combine it with that of death. This is like if you took Defenders of the Faith and Leprosy, put it in a blender, and then made it the debut metal album. Of course, it's not quite at the heights of the masterful levels of Defenders of the Faith or Leprosy. Those are albums that are basically fucking untouchable. But, you know, 
this really isn't that far away from how I enjoy or engage with those records. This album gets by on the fundamentals of its playing, its vocals. Everything about it sounds absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. Songs like Behold the Horse of War Inside the Electric Church and notably Black Leather Hounds, one of the best metal songs of the fucking year. This album does not run out of steam. It's not particularly long, but if you are looking for a good metal album to scratch that 80s, uh, late 80s, early 90s heavy metal itch that you have inside you, then by all means, go after this thing. It's an absolute blast. I put it on and I just feel right at home. Feel like a fucking teenager, want to fucking punch some people. And it is a pretty unique combination of sort of the death thrash and heavy metal that, you know, it kind of existed on the periphery of uh, the main death metal movement, just because, you know, when you have sort of more finer niches, they kind of get uh, lost in the wayside a little bit because of the genre front runners. So something like this still existing in 2021 is really notable. I would put it up there. It's sort of got the same appeal, even if it isn't the same genre as the self-titled Halloween album. If you enjoyed that uh, by any respect, I would totally recommend this to you just because it's sort of that same level of camp uh, too. Uh, that said, it's a little bit darker uh it's got a really cool album cover but yeah metalheads of all varieties just owe this one a listen i really want to see this band thrive and maybe get a little bit weirder but i just love that bands that feel like they could have been picked at a different time period are coming along and able to achieve some level of success or able to make an album like this in in some respect my number three moving back to fifth wave emo and this is maybe from what i can gather something that might be a little less debatably fifth wave this is another record that is again it's kind of made waves critically it's kind of drawn some attention but again it's such a niche project that i feel like a lot of people really haven't fully given it the time of day as well another weird aspect of it too is that i think it's been erroneously classified as an ep because it is a short record it's 18 minutes long but it's unmistakably an album i think the members of this band would unmistakably like it to be called an album and considered an album and as far as i'm concerned it has the heft and it has the substance in terms of like music and subject matter and what this band is doing to absolutely qualify and it's an emo project um the band is called home is where and the project is called i became birds and this is well, the mission statement of this project, which I love, is what if Fugazi wanted to make pet sounds with folk instruments, uh, which is an okay. absolutely absurd sentiment. But it really, I think, captures the sort of thing that they're going for here. Again, it's fifth wave in the sense that it's representative of the musical sounds of a lot of this newer echelon of 2010s uh emo music that's either been made, made really recently by bands like Glass Beach and um delete zeke as i said or that has kind of come to the fore through online circles recently with projects like the brave little abacus in the sense that it's really lo-fi it's really sort of screamy and shouty uh it has strong trans themes i believe i haven't done a heap of research but i believe the front person of this of this band is trans and i believe that is weaved into the lyricism and subject matter of this project in a big way so if that's something that appeals to you then you'll enjoy a lot of what this project has to offer it's loud it's raw again it's a bedroom recording type of thing it doesn't have a lot of polish or whatever put onto it but it fucking knows how to break your door down with what it has and it does so much it's like you know the folk punk slash folk emo equivalent of a spanish love songs album or something it's just that style of music that people who are into that sort of thing will really 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 enjoy um i think that like with the delete zeke record it's taking emo signifiers musically and doing things that feel original and fresh and invigorating with them which i think is a common thread of all the great emo records of this year including my album of the year which you know that's further a few weeks from now to be mm. unpacked further and further but yeah this record again it's it's only 18 minutes long um it's also drawn comparisons to artists like Neutral Milk Hotel and Bob Dylan the latter of whom i believe is a huge influence on the front person of this band so again Neutral Milk Hotel, Brave Little Abacus, you know, all of these kinds of reference points, if that appeals to you, do not miss this project. It is 
absolutely sensational. And I can't wait to see what this band does next because it's 18 minutes long. And if it has any weakness, it's that I want more from it. It is a beautiful taster of what this band can do. And um, it is just outstanding. And the more that I listen to it, first time I heard it, I was like, you know, this is pretty good. This is pretty interesting. This is pretty fresh. And then it's one of those things like three or four listens and you're like, fuck me. This is doing something. And I am a huge fan. And I, you know, I, I again, I push this on just about anyone who will listen. So home is where I became birds. Listen. I actually heard a little bit of this project before uh, you did because our mutual generic orange soda turned it on to me. And um, I, it was basically for reasons that were completely to do with something else other than the album. I had heard a little bit of it and just haven't gotten the chance to return to it yet. But I co-sign everything from what I remember of like that particular sound. It was really, really engaging. So yes to everything Tyler said. And now we come to the final two albums. We get the silver medal of both of our lists. And mine is one that did come out very, very, very recently, just days ago. Uh, and I'm very glad I got to shout it out in some context, just because this is a perfect candidate for something we would cover if it wasn't the end of the year, if we weren't all swamped on the Jams and Tea podcast, uh, because it's sort of a legacy band, a band that uh, several members of the podcast, myself included, uh, care a whole lot about. And that is the new album by Failure alt-rock outfit failure their new album wild tight droid if you know failure it's definitely from one of their earlier 90s albums like magnified or fantastic planet which are two certified classics of the genre uh alt-rock in the sense that they sort of had an influence over the wave of emo that was about to come but they also blended it with stuff like space rock where it sounds a little bit more progressive than something that you would expect it to come from this scene and they've kind of been coming back ever since they tried to sort of there was a gap in their career they released an album in like 2004 that I think like was good but didn't really um make any waves and then after that they sort of come back in the 2010s and they released uh The Heart is a Monster which is an enormous double album that I have not heard yet and then a series of EPs that were eventually all combined to form an album called In the Future Your Body Will Be the Furthest Thing from Your Mind uh, which is a great album that nobody heard and I fear that this album may suffer the same fate because it is a great album and I um, don't think anybody is going to hear it but that said there's a little bit of an obstacle you have to overcome with this and it's not even really an obstacle it's just the fact that I don't think the first three songs here are you know the band operating at 100% I think the first two songs are really really good and then the song after that is like a minute and a half and it's just kind of insubstantive so if you listen to the album and you try to get a taste for it you're going to be like oh maybe this isn't that great but I promise you the rest of the album is nothing but straight fucking heat I am so, so sad that I didn't get to include a song like Submarines or Mercury Mouth, Long Division or Half Moon on my favorite songs of the year list because in another world, they totally could have made the list. The big draw here is two things that failure have always been good at. One is lyricism, honest lyricism about basically tons of stuff that the genre likes covering. But here it's with a really aged and kind of wise perspective and what I really just love about this album is the sound. The space rock uh, influence has never been felt more strongly than it is here. And honestly, that's why I love it so much. That the, Just even on the comparatively lesser like opening two tracks, which are still like properly very good songs, they just aren't as good as the nothing but heat that the uh, like remaining four fifths of this album is uh just absolutely like astonishing like just really classic sounding like I would almost compare some of this stuff to um like laser guided melodies uh in its raw sound but it's also it's got a real sort of organic bent to it it doesn't sound like artificial or electronic uh it's it's real proper blood pumping you know fist in the air kind of shit and you know it's just very much appealing to the type of music that we generally gravitate towards like if we had reviewed this I feel like even you know August probably would have liked this album Morgan would have definitely dug this he's the biggest failure fan among us uh and uh I definitely think that this is uh like at least for me right now I would say it's maybe my second favorite project from them uh just 
undeniably solid album from a band who have been doing it well since the 90s. Please don't ignore this just because it got shoved right under the rug at like the worst possible time. It's a great, properly great album. Yeah, I really want to check this out. Uh, I'm just looking at their inf- info online. They seem like a band I'd be really, really into. So I think I will. A hundred percent. You need to check out Fantastic Planet at some point. I will. I think I'm going to give this new one a listen, just listen, just to give mm-hmm. myself a taste and see how I fall. As like, for my number two, we're almost at the top of the list now. And mm-hmm. uh, predictably, I'm continuing the theme again with another emo-influenced record. Although, again, I would say that the stylistic uh input on this record musically is a little more varied than just tapping it into that particular realm um but it's an artist that we actually covered in some capacity in the last episode of the jams tea podcast proper and that is asian glow and i mm. we spoke very fondly of asian glow's songs on that uh, split album downfall of the neon youth uh some he, that asian glow's songs on that record were universally excellent and yeah. So I was really looking to check out more of their music and the album they put out earlier this year, which is called Cull Fickle, uh, came really highly recommended from a number of my mutuals and was rated really well online. This is also, I should say, like Paranul, one of the other artists that we've talked about so glowingly this year and that appeared on Downfall of the Neon Youth. This is a South Korean bedroom emo shoegaze noise project. Um, But as you will remember from our downfall of the Neon Youth review, the instrumentation and the musical stylings of Asian Glow relative to Paranormal were a little more sort of, a little less purely electronic and a little more kind of like, there was more sort of acoustic instrumentation, more sort of varied vocal performances and things like that. And Cole Fickle is a near masterpiece. This album floored me i'm trying to really get emphasize how much of a surprise this record was it is stunning uh from front to back it is brilliant uh again those influences that i've talked about those genre influences i think i've seen it compared to uh the microphones the glow part two if it were emo online which is a really interesting way of describing this record i think one that's not that far off uh, again, if you enjoy any of that music that this particular wave of shoegazy emo bedroom bands are doing, Asian Glow are just about as good as any of those projects. And this record has a few of s- simply some of the best songs I've heard all year. Uh, particularly, I want to shout out the track No Exit, which is a late comer into my favorite songs of the year list. This song blew me away. And it's not even like the clear standout necessarily. It's probably my favorite thing here, but there's lots of competition. The opening track is an eight minute beast called Circumstances Telling Me Who I Am. And the highlights only continue from there. It's an album that could be tuned up just a little bit, could have some of the shorter tracks cut out of it just a little bit, but there's nothing on here that outright kills the pace of the album. There's nothing on here that outright detracts from the effect of the music. Um, it's a really remarkably strong record front to back and I have had it on rotation I've only you know I only listened to this for the first time about a week ago but I've had this on rotation almost every day since then it's a really really strong album Jake if I were to ask you to like prioritize any of the records I've shouted out Mm -hmm. today I would say make it this one this thing is special Um, it might not, you know, blow you away and and enter masterpiece territory for you, but I think you'll enjoy the experience of this, especially considering that you were quite positive about Asian Glow songs on that other record. Mm. This really is a space where they get to explore their personality musically within this style in more depth and detail, and the melodies are great, and the production is really, really strong for this lo-fi aesthetic, and yeah, it's a brilliant record from front to back, and I now I've talked about some records that have made some critical lists. This thing has just been across the po- across the board, mostly ignored, and that's a real shame. All right, we're here now. Number one feels kind of strange to be like, oh, it's the number one favorite album of the year. Wait a minute, but these uh, albums that I think that Tyler and I are both about to talk uh, both to talk about. Just to sort of emphasize, if we didn't do a good enough job at selling how much we love these, even though they aren't on our list proper, if the, if I can do anything, it's that my number one on this list is something I bought on vinyl. So 
pretty big deal. Uh, and I have talked about it before on our What We've Been Listening To segment, and that is Wolves in the Throne Room's most recent album, Primordial Arcana. And hate to be predictably me promoting an atmospheric black metal album because, I mean, we have done our fair share of promoting those new releases just because that is seemingly, a, there's a new kind of wave of that. And honestly, it's it's manufactured to make tons of music that I feel has been on the, the peripheral of people's uh, attention where it's been like maybe something that people have heard of but never quite fully checked out is that there's sort of a wave of music right now that's sort of like prime for me to be like, hey, now that all of this is, you know, in the spotlight and in the limelight, there's tons of other records that have been like this for years that were happening uh, in the 2010s that people just kind of ignored. And Wolves in the Throne Room are 100% a band that have done nothing but make albums just like that. They started off as a little bit more of a bass sort of uh, meat and potatoes black metal band. And they sort of grew into the movement and I mean, arguably kind of kicked it off. They made an album like Diadem of 12 Stars, a fantastic record of theirs in as early back as 2006. And they really broke through with Two Hunters, 2007's Two Hunters, which is sort of their undisputed masterpiece in most people's opinion, which is a great album that I love. And I also love albums like uh, Celestial Lineage. I like the somewhat controversial synth heavy sort of dungeon synth album they tried with Celestite. And even Thrice Woven in 2017 was a fantastic record. It was them doing what they've done best. And unfortunately, uh, Primordial Arcana, their first album in four years, is, I can basically say it's thrice woven, but in my opinion, a little bit stronger, them doing what they've always done. So there's no new angle I can sort of promote this with, uh, other than the fact that I genuinely, at least from what I've heard, believe that Primordial Arcana is their strongest effort to date. It is, it, if nothing else, uh, I still need to hear like little less than half of their discography to properly make this claim, but this album here is at least their most immediate sounding production wise. This is a perfect blend of atmosphere and aggression. If you really, really like the new Panopticon album this year, this is for you. The vocals on here are in keeping with that kind of stuff, but they also have a lyrical kind of environmental, for lack of a better word, primordial feel to them that sort of get at the elemental part of nature and the sort of decay of the environment. And that's really played up here, but with like a, a mythic twist. So if you want to like dive and look into the lyrics, if you're really compelled by this album, it's really, really rewarding. And obviously it sounds fucking great on wax. Uh, don't need me to tell you that, but it's it's an outstanding record that deserves your attention because if you like stuff that's in the vein of the new Paranormal album, the new Panopticon album, there are shades of that here. This, I, this vinyl is actually golden. It's it's pretty fucking dope, not gonna lie. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's difficult to try and sell this without just sort of selling the band as a whole. But if you maybe want to work your way through their discography and sort of end with this, the sort of pagan black metal edge that they have to their sound makes them stand out amongst other uh, acts that are kind of like this. Basically, the best way I can sell this is this is an album that just never stops firing on all cylinders. No weak points here. All killer, no filler. The bonus tracks are even fantastic, but beginning to end, this album has songs like Spirit of Lightning or Through the Eternal Fields, which compete with the best stuff in this genre that's come out this year. Uh, even uh, I would say that the best song on the album, Underworld Aurora, is as good as anything on the new Panopticon album. And basically it only got over, like not overlooked, but it only just missed my list proper and, and to, to be able to talk about it on our list proper because this year has been so properly great. So if you're looking for a good time to get into this music and you've been listening to stuff like it, there has never been a better time to get into Wolves in the Throne. This is a perfect introductory point for it. Or if you build to it, it's a great way to cap it off with because it's their strongest effort yet. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Don't forget about it. Nobody has talked about this album, and I will not let Wolves in the Throne Room be forgotten, damn it. Yeah, it's funny how, like, 
we're talking about most overlooked albums of the year and this is a sort of atmospheric black metal band that were in their prime one of the mm -hmm. biggest names in atmospheric black metal yep. even had crossover into kind of like the indie world of like pitchfork and whatever mm -hmm. and yet again like i think the middle world like people in the middle world tend to be kind of like uh, tend to stay with bands in the long haul and tend to like not conceptualize mm -hmm. music in terms of like well this band peaked in this era and so they're kind of a product of that era and we don't think about them anymore like metal fans are very faithful I think and willing to kind of stick with bands through long periods of time and so I think that the attention that Primordial kind of might not be getting in the general music world uh, the middle world, I think people are probably really more appreciative and understanding of what a great record this is. And I co-sign everything you said, Jay. I really, really thoroughly enjoyed this record. It's only my second record from this band, but I think I enjoyed it even more than their beloved Two Hunters. It's an album that starts incredibly strong and almost like gets stronger and stronger and stronger as it goes on to the fantastic peaks track of Masters of Rain and Storm, an 11 minute opus. And then it kind of has a little bit of a, a settling period with the last couple of tracks after it that I'm not as hot on, but it kind of builds to that climax brilliantly and it sustains itself beautifully for its runtime. And it and it helps that it clocks in under 50 minutes as well, makes it feel really tight for this kind of album with these kinds of track lengths. And yeah, I co-sign everything you said. It's a really underrated record, deserves more love than it's been getting. Speaking of. My most overlooked album of the year. And again, I almost feel bad because this is an album that has gotten some critical adulation, but still it's more the fact that we were never going to be able to fit this into our best albums of the year list because it just wasn't on enough of the podcast radar and we never were able to review it properly because it just slipped through our fingers and I didn't discover it until it was a bit too late and so but but in terms of like overlooked albums and in terms of like albums I've been listening to a lot I mean this spot really couldn't go to anything else uh, it is indisputably of all the albums we talked about today as much as I am fond of all of the ones that I've heard this is the one I've listened to the most. And this is an album that has been on rotation for me every week since I discovered it. And that is the new record from singer-songwriter Indigo D'Souza, Any Shape You Take. This album is quintessential indie rock. As, as polished and as good as it sounds in 2021, as it could sound in 2021. What might at first seem like a fundamentals indie rock album is actually full of colorful instrumentation, musical arrangements that are more ambitious and surprising and willing to pull the rug under you than they might initially seem, and a personality in Indigo who is simultaneously joyful and full of verve and character and also like able to just bring the darkest and most kind of like morbid and depressive emotions into the fore of her songwriting and really fucking shove it, shove you into it and really make you kind of fester in it. She's a remarkably dynamic performer. And if it were not for her, I mean, she makes these songs what they are. And from front to back, this record is astounding, startling, hooky as hell. I mean, for an album that features uh, the, cent the centerpiece single, Real Pain, one of my favorite songs of this entire year, which devolves into a kind of like second half of just overlapping screams, yep. to be on the same album as, a, as one of the other singles, Hold You, which is one of the most kind of like jaunty and peppy and purely joyful love songs of the entire year, a song that gets fucking better with every second that passes in it. The dynamics of this album, the range that it has, the range that Indigo has as a performer is astounding. She's able to craft songs that bring together influences as far and wide as fucking Phoebe Bridgers and Alex G. You know, it, it, it's a complete hmm. melting pot of various forms of things that have been popular and buzzy and indie but transfused and performed in a really unique and flavorful way that will appeal to those of you like us who wear your emotions on your sleeve and feel things quite intensely because indigo as a performer does that and the beautiful strength of this record as i feel like i've emphasized is how great she is at doing that kind of emotive songwriting but also how great she is at just making you feel 
uplifted and, and, and joyous and like cathartic in your emotional experience. I mean, the fucking the album ends with her begging her lover to fuck her till she's dead. And yet it feels like the most uh, euphoric, you know, um, expression of the whole year in certain respects. Like, it's a really remarkable record that I cannot recommend highly enough. In a year of a lot of great indie rock records from a lot of really, really solid songwriters, this one should be in the top, top echelon, in my opinion. I completely agree with you. I thankfully have gotten to this record when you recommend, first heard it and recommended it to all of us. I think the coolest thing about Any Shape You Take, an album that, frankly, while I have spun it a couple times and while I do love it, has not gotten the attention that it deserves from even me because this is an album that you deserve to parse through and live with. Uh, I'm probably in six months time, I'm probably going to be saying, yeah, this album would have probably made higher up on my list if I had spun it that many more times, but such is life. But the thing is, the cool thing about this album is that it's, it's so easy to sell in the sense that it's like, if you're like us and you really, really are into, say, the Boy Genius crew, uh, this is, like, I, I can't emphasize enough if you even kind of like anything from Lucy Dacus, Phoebe Bridgers, or Julian Baker, get all over this. It is 100% your speed. Or if you found yourself thinking, I just need a little bit more color in something like this, or it's just like, they don't really do it for me. Or, you know, maybe I'm looking for something that's a little bit uh, brighter instrumentally, or, or just, you know, a, a little bit more adventurous. Then I can also say, hey, try this and give it a shot because it might fill the hole that you're looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's it, the, the way that it like, Emotionally speaking, I have to co-sign it. It's like there are parts of this album where I can only describe it as the complete sucker punch, where you're just kind of going along with the song and then a line will just come and hit you and you're just like, oh my, oh my God. And like, I remember like reeling from some of the songs that are on this album for like multiple minutes where I was just like thinking about it. And I was just like, oh my, did that really mean shit? <laughs> like there's some heavy stuff on here. But it's it, it it the way it sounds. Nothing is quite like it that I've heard all year. So I completely agree with Tyler. It's one hundred percent something you should be listening to. Yeah, another comparison that just occurred to me thinking about it is if you're a fan of the band Hop Along, you'll really enjoy yeah. this as well. It's kind of like Hop Along if they're great grandpa, your great grandpa as well. I think yeah, I brought up great grandpa when. I first listened to this as well. It's kind of like if their instincts were a little more attuned to like pop sensibilities as well. Like it's just really, really, really strong stuff. I also want to take this excuse to shout out as well. Indigo also did a cover of Frank Ocean's Ivy uh, just a couple oh, months yeah. ago, I think, that legitimately took my breath away. I, I it's it's one of the best covers of the year. Um, and that if you're a fan of Frank Hirsch, if you're a fan of Indigo, look that shit up. It's on YouTube. She did a beautiful home video to it. And it's just one of the most surprising and emotive covers of the year. With a and song like point I, of uh, you can compare that to Frank Ocean too. If you like Frank Ocean, give this a shot. It's not that far away from it. Yeah, I think the biggest credit we can give Indigo is a song like Frank Ocean's Ivy might be one of the most classic songs of the last 10 mm -hmm. years. And she does it justice, which is not an easy thing to do. And that's a testament to how strong she is of a vocal performer, how strong she is of a personality within her music, and how strong she is of a songwriter as well. So don't miss this record. Don't miss any of the albums that we've talked about today. Please make sure you check them out. And, of course, we want to hear from you in the comments below what do you feel are some of the most overlooked albums of 2021 i'm sure you can probably rattle off a bunch that we probably haven't even heard of and we want to hear of them we want to hear them from you i should also say like this isn't an exhaustive list of all the albums we feel are overlooked this year there are some that have definitely been a bit overlooked that we will talk about in our best albums of the year video and there are some that i'm sure morgan and august would say are quite overlooked that didn't have a, they didn't have the opportunity to join us to speak about so yeah, there's lots more. This is obviously just a sampling of the uh, overlooked albums of the year. This is not supposed to be like the top 20 most overlooked albums. There will be plenty more out there. And that's why where you come in, that's where you're super helpful because you can help us get onto them. 
so yeah we want to hear from you we will be back with more videos later in the week and we will be back with our worst and best albums and songs of the year in the next couple of weeks you do not want to miss those mm -hmm. videos and yeah that's all i have to say rock over london rock on chicago swiffer the quicker picker upper